You are listening to Something Rather Than Nothing. Creator and host, Ken Vellante. Editor and producer, Peter Bauer. This is Ken Vellante with the Something Rather Than Nothing podcast, and we have Maya McGregor, uh, the author of uh, just a fantastic book I uh, grabbed over at Powell's Books in Portland, The Many Half-Lived Lives of Sam Sylvester, a real, uh, gosh, it's just a beautiful book, and, and I'm, I'm happy to have encountered it, and I'm happy to have encountered you, Maya. We're reaching you from Scotland and uh, we'll wish you a, a hearty, hearty hello from uh, Oregon, which is a place you know well. So uh, welcome to the show. Thank you so much. I really am excited to be here. And I, I do love Oregon. I, I lived in Portland for four years when I was a kid from when, from, when was that, 1992 to 1996. So I was quite wee. I was, uh, we left when I was, I think, 11. And um, so I definitely know Portland well. Powell, Powell's was an absolute haven for me as a kid. It was my favourite place to go. I would, any pocket money that I had went, it got given to Powell's for Babysitter's Club's books, Fair, Fair Street books. Um, my cat is punching holes in some paper just now. So if you hear a crinkle, that's because she is attempting to perform the Chew through uh, my <laughs> choose plastic of a, of a hole puncher. So <laughs> yeah, yeah, you get the you get the I get the plastic. I mean, cats going after plastic. I'm like at least paper. At least paper resembles <laughs> the the grass that I think it represents out in yeah. out in the yard. So you know, of course, you knew Oregon when I was listening. Uh, you know, to 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 the book, and I have a a, a copy uh here um. And, and they're just being like, well, wait a second, you know, knowing your background and being like, wait a second, what? Oregon. And um, I've had uh, guests from Astoria. So as far as the podcast goes, you know, my, my, my mind's pulled in in this way, you know, Portland and Astoria and had poets and writers from Astoria, tattoo artists. Astoria is a very unique uh place and right, you know, overall really and in and, and Oregon and in and the book uh takes place there. And not to go on a bit, but I, I am familiar with the Oregon schools. Uh, Sam Sylvester, they are a, a student, uh recently moved uh to to Astoria and uh, you could smell the you smell the sea, some of the sea salt in in, in the air. And um so uh tell us about Tell us about the, the, the book and, and, and how uh, we're in Astoria, uh, Oregon, uh, with the half-lived lives of Sam Sylvester. So when I, was, um, when I was writing the book, originally it started out as much more of a sort of contemporary fantasy where Sam had very literal past lives um, that all died before the age of 19. Um, through the submission process when we were trying to sell it to publishers, we were told we should remove that element, so I did and made it just solely a mystery. Um, but then when we sold it to Astra, um, they were like, we actually quite like the idea of adding paranormal elements into this. So it became a murder mystery with ghosts and the half-lived lives became um, Sam's autistic special interest. Um, so this book's gone through a lot of evolution and... Um, I set it in Astoria partially because I'd, I'd been there as a kid. We used to go to the Oregon coast and I um, always really loved the sea there. Um, and I like I wanted to look for a, a town that wasn't, wasn't horribly small, but was also approachable and walkable for someone who was, who was living in the centre of it and where it could feel like its own sort of character within the story. Um, so that was really what I was aiming for with the setting. And I also wanted it to feel almost like a haven for Sam um, in the sense of they are fleeing um, Montana after trauma and, um, and it's something that really factored into how I was structuring the story for Sam as a, as a character developing throughout the book and being able to find a place where they felt safe because it was almost sort of Goldilocksy in the sense of like where they were in Montana was too small, too sort of claustrophobic in the sense that they could not really hide. And then they went to Portland, which was much, much bigger than they were used to and ended up 
feeling sort of lost among everyone there and didn't really have a place they could settle into. But a story I wanted to be sort of sort of just right in the sense of its role within the story and Sam's development and what they needed, I guess. So um, that was sort of all played into the part of, of why I decided to choose Astoria for the setting. Yeah, and I like to, I mean, I, just as far as, because I had that initial impression that I said, I was like, oh, wow, we're in, in, in Astoria. And, uh, you know, I, I think I, I think uh, the setting is really apt for me. I find it to be a very particular place with kind of like own settlement history and kind of danger of the Columbia River and the, and the fishing. Like, there's all these kind of... I don't know, maybe older elements, some unique elements as far as who ended up settling there, like um, kind of hardy fishermen cultures where you would see, I at least I've seen some more uh, kind of Scandinavian settlement patterns there. You see kind of old uh, union halls and fisheries and all that type of thing. It's, it's, it's quite, it's, it's quite the place. And yeah. um, I, th I, I think what you said about it being its own, its own character and, and to itself, I think it, it just, naturally um lends itself uh to that um so i was um um uh, about the about the book um i wanted to mention one very very particular piece that i i, I don't think i've experienced before uh as a reader listener was that going deep into the experience of of sam who's a person with autism and her life and mind and situations and things that can flare. There's this introduction of a way of uh, experiencing and knowing what can be very unsettling into the environment that most of us would accept, right? And there's a dedication you spend uh, towards describing that, and I think it's a risky thing for an, for an author, and I think you I, I think you do it phenomenally because, like, the narrative arc a lot of times is like trauma, and we would see, you know, like st steps of Sam like getting better, like these kind of like you know towards this, and the experience for for humans a lot of times, or to be you know to have a unique interaction with your environment or overstimulation is it's days are different and, and, and moments are different. And I think uh, at first I was a little like surprised to be like, Oh, sh struggling again. And she's struggling again. And then I realized it's, it's the experience, you know, and you don't just kind of move to her. I think a lot of times when you read, you want to see like these placards of progression and like, yay. And then everything's fine and everything um, so I was able to experience deep empathy, uh, around smells, uh, coming in maybe with, uh, with, with Sam or those simulation and really that you took the time as an author to, to give the experience of that and for the reader to feel it and be like, you know, and, and create a deep connection. It's so noticeable and it was a kind of a profound reading, uh, experience for me to, to, to see that, um, how important was it for you uh, in this character to to get to 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 really describe those pieces and and place the reader in a sense of kind of living next to Sam Sylvester? Um, it was it was really personal for me. Um, I was um, only diagnosed officially with autism um, myself when was that, 2021, so only two years ago. I self-diagnosed when I was about 30, so that was about eight years ago now. Um, but I went most of my life without a diagnosis, um, but it's still being autistic and experiencing all of these different forms of overstimulation and reactions and um, the way other people reacted to me and certain things that I really, it was very important to me on a very personal level to portray that with Sam Sylvester because they are they are based a lot on my own experiences on a sensory level, on an autistic level in general. And um, so I really took a lot of care with that. And I also had a very, very bad experience with diagnosis um, 
my first attempt to get diagnosed, which is also very, very common for people who are not cisgender. So, um, and particularly those who are um, either assigned female or non-binary or visibly trans um, really experience a lot of discrimination when it comes to diagnosis because, because there's still, research is hugely far behind. Um, there's been one specific phenotype of autism that has been heavily researched and that is cisgender white male. So if you are outside of that, any of those characteristics, you are so much less likely to get diagnosed, to get an appropriate assessment even. Um, and autistic kids uh, fall through the cracks all the time, and they still do, even with even with the way things are progressing. It is getting better, but it's it's still very slow. So I, I went through this, like, I was editing Sam Sylvester as I was going through that very traumatic, actually, assessment process with someone who was was just harsh and cruel and I've literally not met someone who's been assessed by this person who did not leave feeling traumatized so like it just bad yeah, stuff um, yeah, yeah. so it's really important to me to portray to portray uh Sam's autism in a way that felt really really resonant to me as someone who is also non-binary Sam you know Sam's non-binary and uses they them pronouns um, and they go through the world in a way that I just want, I, I want to increase empathy in people because I think a lot of the times autistic people, we are perceived in a way that doesn't match our actual experience. So for instance, um, if I am in a place of sensory overload, if there are a lot of smells or if there are a lot of competing noises, if I'm in a pub where there's glasses clinking and 50 different conversations happening and music blasting and all of these things, my brain can't actually differentiate between the importance of all of those sounds. So the person who's standing right directly next to me and trying to have a conversation with me might see me looking another way or appearing to not be paying attention to them or might just see me completely shut down and not be able to respond and think that I am being rude, which has happened so many times in my life where I've gotten feedback from people after the fact. So Sam's experiences and Sam's understanding of their world and how it impacts their life was something really important to me. And that also really coincides with Sam's trauma because Living in a world like that is very traumatic for autistic people. There's very, very rarely autistic people. I don't, I've yet to meet an, another autistic person who's not also someone who has like PTSD or CPTSD because we, it's really, really hard to constantly try to force yourself into a world and deal with that level of extra stimulus all the time without developing trauma responses. <laughs> And yeah. um, so Sam's, those two experiences definitely intersect throughout the book and in Sam's um, character progression. And as the story goes on and you see Sam get triggered by certain things and, and on both levels of trauma and their autism and where those things combine. So, yeah, thank you. I, um, I don't know. I'm, I'm, I'm going to. I'm going to mention a couple of things and it's, it's a little, a little clumsy in my thinking, but, um, I've, you know, in doing the show um, and talking to artists and encountering lots of different minds, right, or atypical minds, or in mine, my my mind itself, what's up here doesn't correspond to a lot of a lot of what I see, not not neatly, right, and and um, you know, I've talked to a lot of folks, and um, my partner's. Uh, uh, a teacher, um, an autism specialist. And um, just, I've really been shocked at like my understanding of like where we are as far as the, the needs in, in, in things like diagnosis. Um, I followed a thread uh, through an author of uh, those diagnosed with ADHD as females. And it has a great title for a podcast, like ADHD. ADHD AF like as fuck <laughs> and <laughs> and and um you know for myself like just trying to learn like me my mind not this self diagnosis understand what minds do just reading the characteristics or some of the experiences of ADHD and there's so many places that there isn't a correspondence where me as a cisgender uh, male where 
you look at it, the experiences are different. How it comes in, how it comes in at you is, um, is different. Uh, I lived in Madison, Wisconsin, uh, for about 10 years and there's, uh, a kind of a special, uh, special education it's a place called the Wiseman Center Research. So you have a college research cultural influence around the area where even the public schools is an attractor uh, for a student's need in a uh, special education. And then I would say I was kind of flipped into Oregon, which was a, a very different environment with different school systems and pieces. And uh, this, as we talk about mental health, a lot of times in the areas, I feel like we're beginning to talk about it. And, and humans been kicking around this earth for a long, long time. I feel like we're starting to talk about these things. And that idea astounds me. <laughs> I can't, like, I can't settle on that. There's been, you know, it's, it's something that's, like people do talk about like there being far more diagnoses nowadays than there used to be and and that's really just because now we sort of know what we're looking for in a way that we didn't before and you know previously like if you were someone with high support needs um I, I highly prefer using high support needs to low functioning or high functioning labels because I find those are not helpful. <laughs> <That was quite laughs> insulting because um, it just really always depends on the context for someone I like the, my ability to function changes daily <laughs> um, and my support needs change daily but previously people with high support needs would have just really been put into an asylum or they would have been you know shut away from society or um, and they would just sort of lump everyone in under certain umbrellas yeah, um, yeah. nervous and, like nervous personality yeah, nervous you know? personality or some any number of things like that and there's um and these days it's it's I think it's really good because we're also seeing how common these things actually are because a lot of the times you know I think we when you have a specific way of being that's the only real accepted way of being for a very long time and it's not really safe to deviate from that in any way um i think that when you start allowing people to to push those boundaries a wee bit and listen to people's experiences and as we've started to understand more about how people experience the world and um, people who may not verbalize with their voice boxes, but who can communicate and tell us about their experiences. And they have just as rich and a textured in our life as anyone else. And I think there's, you know, there's just a lot of learning that's been happening, particularly in the last hundred years, um, about, about different minds and how we work. And, and the neurology even is just actually yeah. literally scanning brains and finding out what's going on in there. Because actually it's different. And that's what's quite fascinating as well, is we really literally are a different neurotype um, and how we experience things, how we process information. Um, and so, yeah, I do think it's really interesting. And, you know, on the on the, the note of self-diagnosis, self-diagnosis is, is so normal. It's just really, it's like very frequently, it's the first way any of us figure out what what's going on with us at all. You want to know, like, what's the answer? Yeah. What is this? We take a guess. Or if we hear things that sound right, then we're like, oh, that actually, you know, that's going to be my first step when I talk to my doctor or something like that. Um, and if, you know, if we have our own experiences, like if you've had bronchitis 14 times, you probably know what bronchitis feels like. So when you go to the doctor, <laughs> you're like, I've got bronchitis again. I got it. Yeah. They'll look down your throat and be like, ah, you've got bronchitis again. You know, and it's, 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 I think on a lot of levels like that, and particularly because with autism and ADHD, there's such a discrepancy in terms of formal diagnosis and access issues. If you're talking in the United States, um, health insurance, having access to a, a provider. When I was in the, the US and was looking for um, an autism diagnosis, I was told it was going to be $6,000. Wow. And yeah, six thousand dollars without insurance. Like that's wow. that's an exorbitant amount of money that most people, I think, cannot afford. And here we have the NHS, which is fantastic. But I also had a really terrible experience with the NHS here. And Scott, like the Scottish NS NHS, has been phenomenal with almost every experience that I've had with them. That's the only one that's been awful. Yeah. And um, 
I ended up having to go private and that was £1,500, which is much less than 6000 But it's still, that was an, an enormous expense that I was very fortunate to be able to pay out of pocket. But, um, but there's just, even at a clinical level, when you're talking to experts, the research is so far behind for most demographics. <laughs> yeah. That you it's, it can be really hit or miss and it can be really demoralizing and it can be really daunting for someone who who is wanting to approach diagnosis but knows that and knows that they are out with that circle of who's going to be an easier diagnosis you know um, yeah. I had another friend who who recently saw that same clinician who was so awful with me and he had he's a cis man he did get his diagnosis but she like it was still so traumatic for him and he just left feeling completely demoralized and broken down and was really really upset and you know like that person really shouldn't be working with autistic people like so it's it's just very much a it's it's really tough and I'm I'm very glad that things are progressing as they are but at the same time there's still a lot of people falling through the cracks yeah yeah well and I think um you know I've seen the issue in a variety of ways. Sometimes you see over identification, under identification, in particular um, uh, cultural groups, you know, what's in the school system, the school system, very complicated dynamic of how you oh, see, absolutely. you know, the, the kind of idea of, you know, the complicated, like oppositional uh, diagnosis for African American. Emotional uh, disturbance is emotional the one that I, I taught special education in DC for one year. And, um, and and that just was so upsetting to me. Like I, I taught I taught the the pupils who had quote unquote emotional disturbance, and yeah. and I was just so upset by the fact that that was a label they put on any child. But it was it was all black boys, and it was just it, is it, 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 it was is oppos it was oppositional is black versus white. Like and it sounds it, like a simple thing to say, but. So this it, it's just it's so stark and it's so obviously racist. <laughs> it's yeah. just. And you see it and you just, you can't fix it. And it's just, it makes it like, you can't fix the fact that these are the labels they're putting on kids when it's like, no, probably a solid half of the boys in my class were actually autistic. Like that's just, but I like, couldn't help that. I couldn't fix it myself. So yeah, it's just very, can feel very demoralizing and also really, in some ways, energizing if you feel in a position where you can actually affect change, um, but it can be really also difficult and just have to meet the, the, the pupils need you to meet them where they are, and so you yeah. just plan with with where you are with them. And, 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 and thank you for for talking about this. I mean, I, I think for, you know just just for myself, I uh, it's something I think about a lot now, and I think I think about it more because of the question I was asking, like how do, how would we just start on this? Because I figure, even for myself, um, uh, I turned fifty one in a month, and uh, I think about my experiences. Um, and what I would say, quite simply, is this: is that um, I have an atypical mind, and I am positive, I am positive, positive, positive that my early adulthood was to um, figure out how to be, how to I, I was liked and stuff in my eccentric personality but how to be what is it that you do in life what are the choices <laughs> in me? if the choices that I think are so radically different than those around me do I adapt my behavior towards and I I really went into that but I I tell you though too not to add into it a lot but um I think it was really heavily tied to drinking to be normal drinking to be like others when like if i was in a bar my uh, bah, too loud excitability all this type of stuff whatever that is yeah it was like normalized or something um and that was helpful until it wasn't helpful <laughs> yeah i think i think a lot a lot of undiagnosed neurotypical people um, I think a lot of us really self-medicate and alcohol is a, is a big way that people do it um, because it does lower inhibitions. It makes you less necessarily concerned <laughs> with social cues. Um, and I think it can, 
it can, yeah and beyond that like definitely other substances as well like when it oh, comes yeah. to stimulants or for people with adhd or for autistic people it could like could be any number of things like um and it's just it's very it's I, my early years of adulthood were quite similar in the sense of trying to not only navigate young adulthood, but also to to learn the rules that I couldn't intuit. And I think that that's something that's really hard for a lot of people um, when when one of your primary differences in neurotype <laughs> affects like whether or not you can actually intuit social workings and things that other people don't need to be taught but you need to be explicitly taught and then how do i do this you get in trouble for asking questions and that's the other weird piece of it is like i used to ask like why i couldn't do such xyz or why you know so you know why people would tell me i'm not supposed to lie but then if i tell them how i'm actually doing when they ask me then they get upset like it's just those sorts of things where like you you don't know. You just don't know <laughs> how to do those things, and so you ha you you keep trying and you keep trying and you gather all this data and you have to like aggregate it yourself in your head and go through all of these different things. And it's a lot of work. And I've like I was just the the friend of mine who just got diagnosed. We had lunch last week, and um and one of the things we were talking about was stimming. And you can't see my hands because I have them below the the screen, but I've got a rock in each hand. Yep. And I am almost constantly stimming because it's a way for me to be able to concentrate because it's an outlet of I think I used the um the metaphor in the many half loved lives of Sam Sylvester where I talk about sensory input is like being a balloon that cannot pop but you've got all of these different straws that are breathing air into you and inflating your insides but there's nowhere for that air to go so in sam's case it comes out in self-harm yeah any sort of physical you often need some sort of physical outlet for it and stim cubes are fantastic i also have those but sometimes i just like a rock because i can squeeze it and it's not going to hurt it um and it's and Sam like will punch their leg and that's also something that I do. I will sometimes hit myself, but now that I know what's happening, I'm a lot less likely to do those things because I have learned how to recognize my body's cues as I get into a place where my if I get overwhelmed, which is why I've been more forgiving with myself with stimming and I've not tried to hide it as much. And yeah. like there are some stims that a lot of people do, whether it's shaking their leg in public or tapping something, those are all stims and not only ADHD and autistic people use them. Um, but my friend and I were, were out and we were both, we were both just at the table sort of doing like occasionally doing this or something like that together and we were it was yeah. nice because it was like we both know what's happening we know like it's it like breathing like if it's like maybe like breathing a little bit just yeah it's letting, just letting it's, it out it's normal and I, I really like trying to normalize that which is why i do like when i'm on a panel or something like that um when I'm on video, I will show my stim cubes and stuff to people and be like, look, look, I've got this today. Um, and here we're on a podcast so people can't see that, but I like I've held them up and have, you know, we are verbally talking about it because right. I think it's important. And it is important to normalize because I think a lot of those behaviors in schools are considered disruptive. So if you have a kid in a school who's got who's who's doing this in the back of the room, a lot of times that kid will get in trouble. And they're yeah. not hurting anyone. They're not. They're like they're. They're not jiggling someone else's desk with their foot or anything like that. They're just you know doing this. But they might get told they're being a distraction, and so they get taught to sort of contain and to to make themselves smaller and to be uncomfortable and to put themselves through physical discomfort of being overstimulated and having no outlet. And then when that boils up yeah. <laughs> to the point where they can no longer handle it, they either outburst and like or have an explosive sort of reaction to something or they implode and might cry or have something that yeah. gets them labeled too sensitive or something like that because after a full day of holding everything in you know they their shoe came untied and they started crying you know like <laughs> it's the one last thing the straw that breaks the camel's back so i think um yeah i think just 
the more that we talk about these things, the more it becomes easier for people to understand just how common they are. And maybe to be a wee bit more understanding, if you see someone in public who's who's moving a bit and looks agitated, it's, it might not be that they're agitated. That might just be how they are how they're remaining not agitated. <laughs> yeah, I think people I think people are seeing a lot more of that and I want to dive into and in and in, uh, just just uh, great to talk with you. Um I want to dive into the, what what happens too with uh with 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 the character. Um you know, we're talking about a lot of the struggles and the way this um you know, sometimes crazy ass world seems to be or misunderstand or minds trying to figure out, but we have this gorgeous, beautiful character, Sam Sylvester, who is a, just a tour de force of a, of a character. And, 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 um, you know, I'm thinking special abilities, special talents, special sem- sensitivity, um, special connection to people. So tell us about this, delightfully designed, fantastically written and mentally stimulating book, many half lived lives of Sam Sylvester. Tell us, uh, tell us what the listeners can get a little feel for the, for the story itself. So, yeah. So Sam, I think one of the things that I loved about writing his character is we have someone who's been traumatized, but we also have someone who's very highly supported by their, their parental figure. That Sam lives with a single dad by choice. Love the uh, dad. Love the dad. Genius, I, genius is like dad wish fulfillment, honestly. <laughs> um, and he, you know, he really, really wants Sam to be safe. So he makes space for Sam to to be Sam. And I think that's really, really important because you see Sam's confidence really come out throughout this book as Sam is able to sort of just be themselves and, yeah. and go through the world in a way that feels right to them. Um, I did want to read a wee bit uh, from this that I think will give a slight... <laughs> I say this. Oh, I, I put it in this book. I was saying, I was saying to Ken before we started recording that I will put a bookmark in a book, and I've got so many copies of Sam around around the shop <laughs> that I will go and look for the one that I bookmarked, and I won't be able to find it. But I have, um, <clears throat> I have a really lovely co- hardcover copy here that um, Dazzling Bookish Shop did sprayed edges for and they're really cool so it's got like the silhouette of a tree and a, and a raven flying away on it and it's in the same colors the purples of the of the title the cover art also I should say on here is one of my just I'm I'm, I'm still just absolutely obsessed with it it's and, a striking uh, it's a striking book uh, as yeah an the ob- cover like, is I just I love it still so so much um So I'm going to read just this wee bit from um, chapter 15. So it's in the middle of the book, but this, I think, gives a good flavour for Sam's sort of processing of what happened to them, as well as these spooky aspects of the book. Yeah. The blank Tumblr post glows balefully at me. It's like it knows everything inside of me that wants to come out. The white text box and blinking cursor ooze resentment, anger. My fingers hit the keys with crisp taps. Coming here was supposed to mean getting away from you. This was a place where no one knew what you'd done but me and dad and those who have to. A place where everyone could know me, but where I wasn't defined by what you did. That's all ruined now. I don't know whose fault it is started to tell someone myself, but I got interrupted. I have to believe that. I stopped typing. My fingers are shaking too much. I hit post, even though the thought isn't finished. I don't quite know what I have to believe. That I can talk to Shep. That I'm safe with Shep. That I'm safe here. The last thought makes me laugh, as if I can be safe anywhere. My laptop goes on the window seat behind my bed. I pull Sam's book of half-lived lives out from beside it. I snuggle down into the covers, tugging them up to my chin. The pages of this book are worn on the edges and it doesn't close neatly because it's so full of pasted-in things, but that just makes it more mine. I open to a page at random and grimace. Lisbeth. She's the one who gutted me for weeks when I learned about her. I have her entire journal on my Kindle and copied a few passages into this book, but it's not her I need to see right now. I flip to Billy's page. Almost as soon as I do, a shiver washes over me. 
and any sleepiness is carried away on the tide. This time, the popcorn smell is unmissable. The buzzed part of my head feels like a startled porcupine. I sit up, shrugging off the covers and picking up my phone to text Shep, but something stops me. When I see my face reflected in the screen of my phone, it's just me. Just Sam. But the smell doesn't go away. I close my eyes and put the phone back down. The air in my room feels like it felt in the principal's office today. Heavy and tense, like the electricity in the air before a lightning storm. I see blue and green waves behind my closed eyes like Margie Frankel's framed mandala. I feel the snap of friction. My stomach growls and the smell of popcorn is so strong I shove back the covers and get up, going to the door to open it. I make it to the top of the stairs, sniffing like some kind of bloodhound, but the smell fades as soon as I leave my bedroom. So does the tension. When I step back into my room, though, Billy's room, it's still there. It feels insistent. My fingers are shaking. What do you want? I don't expect an answer, and I don't get one. Uh, yeah, I, um, <clears throat> I was, <clears throat> heard you talk about the, where they were looking to cut some of the, or think about not exploring the supernatural elements. And this is a story of ghosts, you know, it's a story of people who are here, but not here and they're here. And, yeah. um, it's, uh, thank you. Thank you for your reading. That's my, uh, secret joy with authors. And, uh, <laughs> you offered, um, uh, right off the bat. Um, yeah, the, um, I, I, I thought a lot about, um, just, uh, at first in seeing the title, I'm like, what is half lived lives? And then, then, then quickly, in, in listening to the book, the the very powerful I, I idea of loss too early, or uh, of of what hasn't been lived as as a strong component, and of course, tie into Sam herself, ability to live, ability to um, uh, uh, prosper. I um I wanted to ask you about the about the the book because it, it seems it was kind of special to me to run into surprises related to you with the, with Oregon. And I was at Powell's yesterday after driving yeah. like through the state. And then I was almost leaving. And then I turned back to my partner, Jenny. I said, wait a second, Sam Sylvester's here. And I know there's a Powell's connection. Went back. There was, uh, you know, a, a couple copies. This book seems like a big, super important book. And I'm wondering about the reception of it. Like, I'm, I'm just fascinated. What, what are you, what are your, appearances like what are people asking uh, about this um so it's been really I've been really overwhelmed but most of my interactions with readers have happened online um I haven't really done a heap of events in person um and that is slowly changing um but I think one of the more powerful things for me was um, last year I was invited up to Aberdeen to do um, to do an event at a local high school at Hazelhead Academy for um, the Wayward Festival that Aberdeen U University does, and they have a, a young young people's track for um, for the high school that was organised separately from the one at the university. And, and I was invited there for the day, so I spent the morning in the Gaelic medium unit with the, the Gaelic speakers, um, which was also fantastic. Um, and then in the afternoon, they'd planned an event about Sam Sylvester for me in the library. And what I didn't know at the time was that they actually were planning to bus in all of the LGBTQ alliances from Aberdeen City. So there were about 80 kids there. Wow. Um, and and I had absolutely no idea there were going to be that many people. Uh, uh, so I walked in, I was like, that's a lot of cheers. <laughs> uh, <laughs> First problem. <laughs> yeah, I was like, that's a lot of cheers. But they hadn't read the book yet. The book, the, the book had just been out for a few months in the US and had only just come out here in the UK because it was a few months late. And um and I was just really not sure what to expect because, you know, with teens, sometimes they can be quite shy um, and they don't, 
might not be willing to ask questions. Um, but I talked to them for a wee while. I just told them about my own experiences. And I told them about Sam and I told them about how my own experience sort of dove- dovetailed with Sam, how you know Sam's life was based on a lot of my own personal experiences growing around, uh, growing up um, all over the place and then, you know, living for several years in, in a small village in Montana. Um, and a lot of Sam's experiences there came out of my own. Um, and then I asked them for questions and they absolutely blew me away. They asked me everything under the sun from how do I get more motivation to write or does, you know, does fanfic count? And I'm like, yes, fanfic absolutely counts. Write all of the things. That's yep. So many people learn how to cut their teeth on story by, by writing fanfic and it's beautiful, do it. Um, and everything from writing about, you know, like writing craft questions to how do I come out to my parents? And I think I might be non-binary, but I'm not sure. And after I, after we all finished, a lot of these kids, you know, asked their questions in front of everyone. And um, yeah. But afterwards, they absolutely mobbed me. And I had never had an experience like that before. They, like, I swear all 80 of them queued to come and talk to me. And yeah. They, they just they confided in me, and they, they told me how excited they were to read the book, and how it meant something to them to see a character like them, and, and it just really it, it really really touched me, on so many levels, and I had I had a moment um before before they all started coming up to me, just where where I looked around and I was just like I have to tell you all this like you know, seeing so many of you here sitting in front of me in in school. Yeah, yeah. As part of your school day, like, yeah. that was unthinkable when I was their age. That was absolutely yep. unthinkable um, that you, you could have 80 kids who were out enough to, to go to a queer-themed event and on purpose. <laughs> you know? Yep. And with supportive teachers at their backs like these teachers were there like a hundred percent like there for them the library was covered in pride flags anyway the school had murals like supporting queer students and and it was I told them I'm like I I know things are scary right now like they're they're so scary for kids right now still and seeing the backlash that that we are getting after the progress of the last few decades is really hard yeah but but they have each other in a way that my generation didn't. Like they are visible to each other. They have a community that is present and accounted for. Uh, and they're, that's not speaking for all the kids who are still in the closet and who still maybe might be questioning and not have that yet. But there's there have been massive strides happen. So the reception to the book like has been absolutely beyond any of my expectations and the, the messages that I've gotten from from people I got a handmade card with a four-leaf clover on it and from a fan in Germany and um, I've, I've just been really really touched um, by by everyone's response to it and I think the reader responses have been have have been like I mentioned I think to you before we started recording Sam Sylvester was my 17th novel um, and I've, I've frequently published to resounding silence. <laughs> and, uh, you know, I think it can be quite discouraging sometimes. And this book made every rejection, every every failure, every day of publishing to crickets worth it. Because sam's meant something to people in a way i wrote the book that i wish i'd had at that age and i'm so glad i did because it's i want it to be there for i want it to be there for the next generation so they they always have these books so so no generation ever has to grow up again without them well congratulations i mean it, it it's it's truly it's truly an important book and i think the you know i i think the approach of, of, of any reader is um, I, I think when you, when characters are the ones, when you have that close connection to the character, the way that it's written, you, 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 
you moved into the experience and the building of empathy through the written word is, 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 is profound, is profound for change for me and having a, a wonderful character person, Sam to <laughs> connect to is, uh, incredible. So, um, goodness, uh, you sing as well in Gaelic and, um, I saw that and I went on to deep hunt and saying, where is it all? And, uh, but you're gonna have to tell us uh, about it. I was deeply fascinated with lyricism, book writing. Uh, I, I, I must admit, I, I know Gaelic and, uh, uh, tell us, tell us, tell us about what, what we need to know and, and where you're, where you're from when, where you're talking to us right now. So I am speaking to you from Glasgow, Scotland, where the sun has just come out again, which is nice. It's, it's, the clouds here move very quickly, and it's always fascinating for me to watch them. You can literally just sort of track them across the sky. Um, but, um, yeah, so I, I live in Glasgow, which is the biggest city in Scotland, um, and the best one. Sorry. All the oh, hey. You know, <laughs> Glasgow, Glasgow I, Edinburgh rivalry. I, I, I was going to say, like, I know, that's all I know, that the Edinburgh, I had a... Yeah, uh, we, we have fisticuffs. That's cool. Really. But um, <laughs> but um, I, I live in the tr actually historically Gaelic part of Glasgow, Partick, um, where a hundred years ago there were uh, thirty thousand Gaelic speakers. Uh, wow. Lots of Gaelic speakers came down from the Highlands and Islands to work in the shipyards on the Clyde River, um, and um, my upstairs neighbour is actually from Harris and is a, a, a native Gaelic speaker. Um, I sing in two different Gaelic choirs, and the the my sort of normal choir in the sense that it's my weekly choir that I go to is the Glasgow Gaelic Musical Association, uh, the GGs affectionately, and we we meet uh, in a local church every Monday and we sing traditional Gaelic choral music, which is uh, it's such a huge part of my life and it's such an important part of my life. Um, Gaelic, Gaelic music has a, a number of traditions that just don't exist even in other Celtic countries and languages. Um, we have different types of song that are very specific to Scottish Gaeldom. And um, and it's it's such a pleasure getting to sing uh, choral music with people. Um, and I sing in that choir. I also sing with uh, another choir that's formed from singers from all over Scotland. And we are Koshar Alapa, which is a Scotland choir. I guess that sounds weird when you translate it. <laughs> but we were actually formed for the 2019 Eurovision Choir uh, competition in Gothenburg, Sweden. So we travelled to Gothenburg in 2019 um, to compete with other European choirs. And we were the first ever um, Scottish representative on the Eurovision stage as, as Scotland and not as the UK um, there was also a Welsh choir there, which I think held the same distinction for themselves. Um, all right, all right. And it was such a phenomenal, beautiful experience um, with people singing in their native languages and um, and just being there to enjoy music together. I think yeah. one of the most phenomenal experiences was when we lost. Like we didn't get, uh, we didn't go into the finals. And I think it was my conductor, Joy, who was like, you know what, let's just all go out into the car park and sing our final pieces because we wouldn't have had a chance to sing them otherwise. And so all of the choirs who didn't make it to the finals, we all went out to the car park in this massive stadium in um, this arena in Gothenburg and um, just all performed our final pieces to each other like a, like a pitch perfect riff off essentially <laughs> and i wasn't i wasn't i wasn't gonna say that was in my mind i wasn't was saying my one. mind was going no, to be perfect <laughs> so deke sharon who um did the did the acapella music for pitch perfect he was one of the judges of this competition. are you kidding me <laughs> yeah. he, he also he knows my agent sarah uh, because her <laughs> husband mark um is in face vocal band which is an acapella band so it was a really funny random weird connection but, um <laughs> But it was just, like, I've never experienced anything so electric. And it wasn't, yeah. it, there was no audience aside from ourselves. And it was really just, it was, everyone was just gassing each other up, like, cheering and laughing and having, like, just 
absolutely all eyes on the choir performing. Um, and it was such an, a magical moment. So uh, Gaelic music is obviously a huge, huge part of my life. I'm actually doing my first, uh, my first choral, sh- my f- choral, my first solo gig um, in ooh, slightly less than a month on the 28th here at the Glasgow Centre for Contemporary Arts, uh, CCA. Um, uh, it's called Stratic in the Strage, and it's a series of, it means street sparks, and it's a series of um, musical events that have been put on by an organisation called Keolis Crack to um, to sort of showcase contemporary Gaelic music. So I was actually commissioned along with a Broken Chanter, who's a fantastic um, sort of indie pop musician here in Glasgow, um, to to create a set of original Gaelic songs for this event. So we are going to be performing um, those songs and a few of Divey's uh, own songs in Gaelic. Um, and then we'll be performing with our good friends, Josie Duncan and uh, Manny the Minch, which will be fantastic. I'm, I'm just really, I'm really, really fortunate to, to be in a place where, you know, I think Gaelic language and Gaelic music are, are part of a culture that has been actively sort of killed off in the last 200 years. Um, there are only 55,000 remaining Gaelic speakers and the language is is declining hugely. There are very, very few communities where it's still spoken as a community language, where 100 years ago in the Highlands, if you'd gone to the Highlands, 75 to 90% of the population would wow, have spoken yeah. Gaelic as a first language. Yeah. So, um, so it's just, it's, it's, it's really, really deeply important to me to, to continue on our traditions and to create original things in Gaelic. So I am also working on my first Gaelic novel. Um, and I have a new novel on submission that I hope, I hope, I hope, I hope finds a home that is um, set in Argyll that is a contemporary fantasy that involves the fair folk and um, and an autistic agender protagonist who stumbles into their world. And, um, and it involves a lot of Gaelic and a lot of sort of things that I think about a lot in terms of intergener- intergenerational language transmission and how we pass on it, community knowledge to the next generation and those ties, what happens when they get broken um, and how we rebuild them. So, um, yeah, so it's Gaelic yeah. music obviously forms sort of the backbone of my daily life, actually. So um, very important to me. <laughs> yeah, the, the, the important uh, language, my simple, my simple thinking on it, you know, I'm trained philosopher, thinker, you know, in my life academic background. But for me, I've always sought so, uh, the connection of language and ideas. I, I think there's ideas that can be only expressed in particular ways through language and I think the ability to have language to offer up ideas outside of translation or anything like that, that, that the mind moves through what you can express or you can't express with, with the language. Yeah, that's, I think that's absolutely true. And I think on a macro level, um, there's the, the Saper Wharf hypothesis that they talk about, which is the idea that that language dictates how we think. Um, And I think on a macro level, there's a lot, a lot of linguists will, you know, have sort of poo-pooed that idea, which rightly so. I mean, it's there's one thing to make it a causal thing, like if you speak this language, you will be able to do X, Y, Z. But yeah. but also on a on a more micro level, to anyone who speaks more than one language fluently, will tell you, like, yes, there are there are things that you ex- you think about differently when you are expressing them or framing them in one language or another, and I think. I, I notice I notice Gallic turns of phrases in my English these days. Um, I will, like I said, something like, "Oh yeah, I'll put that to you," um, which I meant I will send that to you. But in Gallic, we that's how we say it. We say, "I will put put that to you." Yeah, yeah, <laughs> um, yeah. And um, and just certain things that sort of the way that I look at things. I when I whenever I'm teaching someone basic Gallic, I occasionally, if a friend is interested, but but like slightly anxious <laughs> I guess about try they like I will offer to like sit down with them and go through some basics and stuff with them and one of the things I always start with is I will put something asymmetrical in the center of the table um, and I will ask them to look at that from wherever they're sitting and the way I describe this is if you've got this asymmetrical object in the middle of the table you have English and the other Germanic languages that are on 
sort of one corner of it and they are all sort of looking at it from the same direction. Um, so they have a similar view. They'll describe it similarly. Um, you might have a couple of wee differences, but especially if there's a pattern on the thing, they might not see a certain aspect of it. Then you have the Romance languages, which are also sort of clustered in their own bit, and they're quite close to the Germanic languages. Like a lot of the structures, the grammar, the way that they form, you know, subject, verb, etc., gets put in particular orders and stuff. You've got the Scandinavian languages that are close to the Germanic languages. You've got the Slavic languages a little bit farther around. And if we're just talking European languages, you've got the Finno-Ugric Greek languages, which are over on the other side doing their own thing. <laughs> and you've got the Celtic languages, which are on the other end of the table entirely. And yeah. a lot of the you know ways that we frame things in the Celtic languages um, just are, are quite different to the way that people think about them in English. But the moment you can sort of say, okay, imagine looking at this thought from over here instead. And just the one simple example of that is, you know, in English, we t frequently talk about having things and we are things. We Like we say, I am sick or I am um, angry or I am jealous or all of those different things. Or I have, I have a book. So... Gallic, we don't actually have a verb for to have. So we use prepositions in Gallic in a way that, re that, that creates a different relationship between the speaker and what they are interacting with. So in Gallic, a book is at me. So ha So, um, and we, you can say I am sick in Gallic, but if you're saying I have a cold or I have the flu, you say that sickness is on you. Emotions ah. tend to be on you. Ah. Rather. So there's just a different way of framing where you see in sort of degrees of that as well. Because if you say, Hami Fedegach, I am angry, that has a different register of intensity than Haferagoram. Like there is anger on me. So it's it, there's different aspects of, of that shift that go with a different relational um, interpretation of whatever that asymmetrical object is in the in middle the yeah so yeah I think with language it, it definitely it's it is it does shift and I think the most important shift a lot of the time is also recognizing that these ways of thinking and the ways of expressing things are really priceless and once we lose them they're gone and that's yeah. something that's really like you see that in the united states with indigenous languages as well yeah. where you know there might be only 10 remaining speakers of a language and that's just the the level of intergenerational knowledge and understanding is just so deeply priceless that losing it is is i mean there's a reason that like killing off a language on purpose is on the list of genocide symptoms. Yep. <laughs> um, yeah. And it's because of that. It's such a huge cultural keystone. Um, aye. So that's a big part of my, my life with Gaelic. I, uh, I, 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 I find it deeply uh, uh, fascinating like in the, in the terms you express of like, how those words work in, 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 you know, the structure of that it's a lot of, it's something that a lot of people don't, you know, think about. And, and, and I think to think about it, I think about in terms of art and how we express ourselves. Like, I know that there's a deep, there's a deep beauty in these unique expressions in a world that needs a, you know, the drive is towards, you know, singular vocabulary description yeah. and, and instructions, um, which we know is in a certain sense necessary to limit for access. But, you know, it also kind of cuts away from any type of adventurous mind of, of like different ways of uh, communicating. OK, yeah. I have to I have to ask you this, uh, Maya, uh, uh, you've written quite a few books um and uh you sing and i'm sure um uh, there are lots of other different type of creations <laughs> that, that you engage with but um i wanted to ask you um what what do you think art is um you know you spend so much time in creativity and in creating discrete objects um what is what what is art and why do you uh 
why do you why is that what you you know what you do I think for me art and this this literally just popped into my head so I'm going to run with it yes I think art is the transfer of a feeling from one person to another and the mode of that transfer is obviously going to be whatever shape that takes whether it's visual art or um, narrative art or um, musical art or a combination of all of those things because we do that Um, and so I think that for me the transfer of a feeling from one person to another um, I think that I do it because I spent a lot of my early years um, not speaking. Um, I was not fully non-verbal, as they say. Um, not speaking is what I would prefer to say. Um, the other term is selective mutism. Um, but I was very frequently stuck in in my own head in a way where I didn't feel like I had the ability to convey an emotion from one mind to another. Mm. Um, I couldn't, I couldn't really express in a way that I was understood and people weren't trying to understand me. So I think that I create art and I think where I found my home in stories particularly was that it was a safe place for me to explore understanding and being understood. And if I couldn't get answers or couldn't express myself in my daily life, what I could do was explore emotion and explore interaction and explore worlds in a book where I had a safe and discreet place to sort of do that. And um, as I've gotten older, I've just realized how important that was for me and how that I'm not alone in that and how a lot of kids and a lot of people need that sort of space. They need that sort of safe place to, because a book, you can always put it down. If it takes you to a place you're not ready to go, yeah, yeah. you can always put it down. And I mean, that happened to me. I remember I was 11 years old and I attempted to read Roots by Alex Haley, oh, which yeah. as an 11 year old, that's, that's a, that's a quite a book um, to pick up. And, and, I found it, I I hit a part where I, I, like, it became too real, I think, because we were living in Portland at the time in North Portland, you know, historically black part of the, the the city. And, and I, I, like, I knew it just, it just hit too close to where I lived and people I loved. And, and I just, like, I knew that was true. And I knew, because there was also a really, really horrific um, uh, white supremacist murder. Um, what was his name? Uh, I'll, I'll this, try to. Was this on the IMAX? There was the IMAX. Uh, mm, on, the, yeah. on the Metro, there was, there was hate remember. stabbing. Yeah. Oh, no, this was in like 1990. Um, oh, yeah. Yeah. Um, uh, I'm sorry. The I believe the Ethiopian uh, yeah, him, e- uh, immigrant. Oh my gosh! I'm yeah. His well, name like is fluttering at the back of my mind. And I, but I was very young when that happened, and it was very like I, I just remember that happening and having those sort of two moments, sort of like converge in my mind of just like this is still real. This still happens, and that's that's wrong. That's not okay. But I, my little brain couldn't quite process that at age eleven, um, and so I was glad I had that book. To make that connection, and also, you know, I I, I put it down for a few years, <laughs> um, and came back to it later. But I think you know, books and stories and art are just that book is so important. That book is so vital, and um, and it provides a, a human look into 
what is the most like one of the most disturbing mass dehumanizations in history. Um, so I think on so many different levels, books can and art can be an escape. They can be an escape from this world and all of those things that still are real and exist and harm people, um, systemic oppression and racism and homophobia and all of those different things. And they can also be windows into those things for understanding, for creating empathy, for uh, so art for me of that transfer of a feeling from one mind to another is is this is magic. It's it's the our single most magical power, I think, in existence is because you can create something that evokes an emotion in someone. You can transfer that feeling to someone else via a book or a piece of art. Banksy uh, has a surprise exhibition here in Glasgow. Uh, it's his first solo show in 14 years. Whoa. And I went to it last year. Yeah, and he chose Glasgow for a very specific reason. And he opens this exhibition. You walk into our... Um, um, the Glasgow Museum of Contemporary Art, of Modern Art, and it's um, it says, I know you will have seen at least one masterpiece today because you've just walked past it. And it's the Duke of Wellington statue outside of Goma, and he sits astride a horse looking resplendent, and atop his head for decades has been a an orange traffic cone. And this has been an act of Glaswegian sort of yeah. art for the last yeah. long time. And the council tries to take it down. The cops try to take it down. It gets put back. Um, occasionally people will pile a whole bunch of them on there. They're, they think they got up to 10 one year and they, when they took the extra ones down because it became a falling hazard, they left one because they knew it would just come back. They're like, so, hey, here's, here's your one. <laughs> yeah. So Banksy chose Glasgow because of this. And, um, and the art, you know, Banksy's art is a very particular type of art. And one thing he does that has absolutely t caught fire for people, and the reason he is the name that he is, is because he is able to take something very, very simple, and that's a stencil and some paint, and evoke a feeling, to put a feeling from one person to another in a way that surprises people, that delights people, that infuriates people, that yeah. you know, he has has done that. And I think it's just amazing to me to see the magic of the human mind and all of these different things that are possible. Um, I, so the reason I do what I do is to participate in humans' magical process of alchemy, <laughs> I suppose. Yeah. Yeah, I um wow, I um I wanted to uh uh mention I wanted to pull that name uh Mulagetha Sarah was yes, the, um, the Ethiopian Ethiopian in, immigrant uh sorry listeners for not pulling that right up. I, I actually um I, I listened recently, which is for me was a surprise that my my brain wasn't working right there. Is um there's a podcast called It Did Happen Here. And uh mm -hmm. This this phenomenal independently produced podcast uh, is about anti-fascist struggles that took place in Portland, Oregon, following the 1988 horrific murder of uh, Ethiopian immigrant uh, Mulligata Sarah uh, by racist skinheads, racist white skinheads. And this uh, podcast, the story how disparate groups uh, use a diversity of tactics to fight neo-Nazi violence and right-wing organizing in the Rose City in the 1980s and 90s, which, uh, you know, some of your contact and familiarity with the extremely complicated history that is Portland, that is Oregon, uh, particularly around Absolutely. race relations. I, um, I, 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 it was a great podcast. Everybody uh, listen to it. It's uh, basically in a community radio format, but it talks about the real dynamic, one of which was described to me uh, by by a good friend of mine uh, in the Washington D.C. underground punk scene in the '90s, and just the general dynamic that these scenes, you know, these were underground scenes, and these scenes were battles for influence between opposing <laughs> groups, hatred, white skinhead, intimidation, violence, killing, beating up people, eliminating difference, versus folks. Folks who were fighting and trying to clear out that scene. This was not yeah. peace sign up in the ear. No, this, yeah. this was creating space. 
uh, for folks. So highly recommend that, 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 um, that podcast. And I understand you talking about that. I have difficulty in the experience, say the Oregon, you know, experience, not just to drive on Oregon. It is the one state that was constitutionally set up to disallow persons of color to live here. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. And, That's something that a lot of people really don't know about don't, Oregon, they, especially yeah. with, you know, the sort of reputation of Portland these days. Uh, and I think that that's it's something that people don't understand really. It's not something that just goes away. It's not something that like, Oh, we changed it. It's fine now. It's like, that's, that's, that sort of instant, like deeply institutionalized uh, and systemic racism is something that shapes a place and has effects that stretch into the future. And so I think that, yeah, like reckoning with that is really important. Glasgow has been doing, um, a lot of a lot of reckoning with um, the history of the slave trade and how Glasgow benefited hugely from money that came on the you know literally at the price of human lives and bodies yeah. and um, and so this there's been a number of exhibitions that have um, come through Glasgow that have specifically looked at the, you know Buchanan's the names of the streets that we walk down you know these people who who, <laughs> who have streets named after them but you know they, their wealth entirely came from the transatlantic slave trade um, uh, and I think that like it's something that for a long time, people wanted to sort of be like, oh, well, it wasn't like the South in the United States or anything like that. But like, no, actually, it just got baked into the literal landscape around us with that money. And so like, it's, it's our responsibility to to look at that and to be aware of it and to not erase that from history because it's like, it's... Yeah, and the political question is, you know, in engagement, disruption. You know, I think, uh, I think in, I think in art, in the sense of, you know, my 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 approach has been, you know, I, I've I've lived and um, I, I I I haven't got around the idea that some things are s- simply wrong, based on deep ignorance and um, have a really negative effect on human flourishing. <laughs> <laughs> it's the yeah. easiest way that I can say. It's it's, it's, just, it's, it's, it's honestly like I always think of, I just I come back to just how banal it is, really, because it's just it's so. It's just so counterproductive. Like I feel like all types of extreme prejudice are just also so massively counterproductive in terms of just like. They're they are very basically wrong on a very simple level of just obviously this is this is this is not how you human <laughs> and also like gosh just the absolute brain power and innovation and curiosity and things that like throughout human history we could have created if we weren't so busy being terrible terrible colonists and trading people like I think you know it's just it's it's it feels so just ass backwards as they say yes <laughs> but, uh, yes that's our that's our technical philosophical term <laughs> ass backwards yeah my my and I arrived at and I don't know what, <laughs> I don't know what the Greek is for that or uh... <laughs> oh yeah I think like that's something that I I really wanted to grapple with I'm uh I'll do a sort of segue into um the the other wee book i wanted to mention because i have another book coming out in the next two weeks it comes out yeah tell us tell us about it tell us about it so in 2014 i started writing the series and i really wanted to sort of grapple with climate change in a way but through a magical lens and so um i started writing the series um and it's an epic fantasy that takes place in a world where this isolated community has literally weaponized the land itself to drain drain energy and resources from the land to the north of them and create basically a land flowing with milk and honey where they live for their own betterment. And um, I had not actually read Le Guin's uh, The Ones Who Walk Away From Omis Lass before I, before I wrote this book. And I, I haven't read, read that one. but It's I, fantastic. Yeah. And it was very surreal reading it because it, it, it touches, it's really similarly themed to this series because um, this, this series, if you have read it, um, the, this 
series is sort of based on, okay, what if the ones who walked away from Omas Lass um, decided, okay, right, we are going to actually fix this and we are going to um, do the work to make this right. Um, and the the sort of basis, if you're not familiar with that story, is that there's this very prosperous city that everything is, is wonderful and healthy and safe, um, but in order for it to be healthy and wonderful and safe, there is a child who is kept in extreme pain and torture. Um, and that child, everyone knows about this child and they live their lives with the knowledge of this child that their prosperity, their safety, their happy holidays and wonderful life is founded on the abject suffering of this um of this this single child so it's very it's it's a tough read um and so the 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 title of it is what happens when some some people find out about this child and they leave and they never come back um but this this series is an epic fantasy that sort of asks that same question it was very strange since i had not read that and then people after they read it they were like oh have you like it's like le guen's i'm like oh is it um (laughs) But there's lots of there's lots of magic and and finding home and a sense of of exploring your world. It's it's a um, I'm trying to think of a good way to sum this up. I should probably just read the back of it to you. Yeah, yeah, nah, yeah. Tell us. I mean, we 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 need to know. And uh, yeah. yeah, and it's an almost completed trilogy, so you don't have to wait. Because now there's two books, and then oh, um, that that that's oh, selling three. point. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I need my three. <laughs> so, magic forms both feast and famine. Corinne has never known hunger. Born into the hearthland, a lush world of fertile fields and abundant resources, her biggest worry is whether she and her three friends will find their true names on their journeying. But when one of them is murdered on the morning of their departure, Corinne's peaceful world is stained with blood. As they travel north, Corinne and her friends discover a horrible truth. Their land's bounty is no mystery. An ancient spell cast by their ancestors is draining the very life force from the lands across the northern mountains, weathering the earth and starving its people. Forced to confront the truth, Corinne must decide her own fate, remain silent and allow the murder of the earth itself, or risk her own life in exile and break the spell. The hearths of home have only ever nourished. Now the hearthland will see just how hot a fire can burn. All choices have consequences. So the first one is called Hearthfire and the second is called Tidewater. And then the final book in the trilogy is called Windtaker. And it will be out on the 18th from BHC Press. So, All right. Well, I didn't expect to make this announcement. I might end up just shutting down something rather than nothing for a month and a half. I get it. Get it for all <laughs> these books. Sorry, everybody. I never knew that a guest would come on and you know, create a, the, the, the reading list that has to be, a you know, I'm well, sort of, I'm sort of kidding. I'm sort of kidding. The show will continue, but I have to fit in, uh, <laughs> fit in, <laughs> fit in my reading. Um, uh, thank, uh, and thank you. And, um, those are under the author name of Emmy Mears. Sorry. Yeah. I should have said that. I write no, under no all worries. different names, but Emmy Mears, um, E M M I E M E A R S. I love the sound of that too, Emmy Mears. Yeah, Mears was like, my grandmother's maiden name. So all right, all right. Um, I wanted to because there's no good time to to ask it. I get to throw out the big uh, clunky question about the existence of the universe and like why any of this, any of this, you know, while we're talking or anything. But uh, the 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 funny, profound, uh, or annoying question is uh, why why is there something rather than nothing? Uh, Maya, what, what what are we up to here? <laughs> what are we up to here? There is something rather than nothing because of connections. Because somewhere once upon a time, a couple things bumped into each other and kept bumping into each other and more things bumped into each other and exploded. And then things kept traveling and moving and across billions of years those things grew legs and walked on land and started to think and start to connect and interact with things around them and eventually there happened us and I 
I've been thinking about this question a lot, actually, lately, because we are, you know, made of star stuff, as they say. And it's, it's actually just the literal truth, like our atoms, everything, every part of us was forged in the violence of a birthing star. And we are the universe come to life and thinking about itself. And if there's any proof that there is good in this universe, it's the fact that love exists, that the universe from from the fiery heart of a star came came love, came yeah. art, came yeah. the, came justice, came the will to to not allow the bad guys to win, <laughs> came you know the desire and the impetus to effect change to to make the world better than we left it, and I think that we are all here as part of that universe, having an experience of itself. And I've, I've been thinking yeah. about it so much lately, actually. So that's such a good question. But yeah, I think the point is connection. I, is well, and, and not to, not to interrupt, but what you're saying, there's, there, there's a piece there. My mind gets settled to, I actually enjoy about it is the reflection upon the self like that, that idea. And yeah, I mean, you obviously go through, I'm saying the fundamental, the fundamental piece of it, you're saying like, you know, I always, I always think stardust, I, my mind says it always stardust and it's always Bowie. And then like there's steps in my mind. So I understand what I'm talking about. Outer space, yeah. Bowie, stardust, like people. Um, but, but, but just the, the the general idea of reflection or philosophy or art, you know, I do a philosophy and art uh, show. So like the reflection and 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 the energy, right? Like you got a lot of energy. I have a lot of energy. Like being like, what's going on with this? And what the hell is Oregon? And you what know, even is in Oregon? <laughs> like what is? I like I get to this place. Uh, Who knows? <laughs> I, I go to parts of Oregon. I lived in different areas. I'm like I t- I know I took a time travel machine. I I I, I did. I did. Um, um, <laughs> but, um, no, I really appreciate, uh, your thinking on that. And I, I love, you know, um, when it comes down to, to guess and I, 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 I just adored the arts, but, um, for me, it's, it's books, you know, it's books were the first thing that I had English lit major. I read, uh, obsessively and there's such a power in, in language and what you've shown and what I'm saying about your, your book. Uh, as well, it's very noticeable to me that this is an important book and that these books, you know, let's not overlook it. Like I say, I'm, this is going to go to three or four other people. As a matter of fact, I can tell you two of these folks absolutely need to know this to know that there's company for them. This book that I'm holding and, uh, you know, I know it's pontificated, but, but that's, that's what this is. And that's a beautiful that's a beautiful thing because you can hand it over. And I look at the cover of this book and it's inviting and it's beautiful and the colors are beautiful and the story is beautiful and the art that goes into the world and does the type of work here. And fuck, I love ghost stories. Ghost stories are so much fun. <laughs> and I, I absolutely love, um, I absolutely adore the sort of genre of ghost stories as a, a way of understanding human connection and understanding ourselves of self-reflection. One of my favorite pieces of media in the last few years has been The Haunting of Hill House. And and it's it's such a powerful yeah. story. And it is full of ghosts. It's a chock-a-block yep. full of ghosts. And it's such a profoundly human experience of grief and time and how we understand all of those different things and it says a lot of interesting things about time as well about ourselves going back to warn us or to help us and um yeah i think that there's there's so much power in that and especially because death in western cultures is still very much a taboo um we go through you know we go through it peripherally and we all get to know it over the years but at the same time we still don't talk about it very much yeah. And we still don't make space to talk about it very much. It still makes us very uncomfortable. Yeah. Um, and But it is just something that happens and nothing is ever really created or destroyed. Those energies and those atoms were in the heart of a star and they're in the person now and tomorrow they'll be somewhere else. And we all sort of engage with that as we can. <laughs> and I think that ghosts are 
a really fascinating way to do that as well. I love a ghost story. Well, yeah, and and you know, the thing is, uh, you know, within 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 philosophy, and you know, um, you know, with within, you know, that that inquiry is 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 trying to, um, I don't, the, I, I would say like this, um, you know, uh, like even traditional Western philosophy, you know, Socrates dies, and there's this haunting, you know, that's through the writings of Plato, who I found to be a absolutely brilliant writer uh writer as writer um plato but talking there's this ghost of socrates there's this pursuit of justice and there's death and 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 you know how do we prevent a society from screwing up and killing great people like how do we structure it what is what is justice and this there's something you know and even plato i think there was some sort of connection to this around you know philosophy me and the contemplation over death right of of affinitude and uh it's it's big the ghosts i'm i've been deeply intrigued by ghosts i i can't think of a topic i struggle more with than death but i just know that that i do it's it's way too big for my brain um and i think ghosts and stories help me uh help me move in that area and, and 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 deal with it right yeah, it's absolutely. Um, it's. I think that like that's another aspect of of books and art is is understanding our world world and also understanding our own experiences in in that world as we navigate through things because there's just so much. So many times in our lives where we we might feel really alone, we might feel like we are the first person to ever feel this feeling and we're not like yeah. it's we are all unique but also there have been enough similar situations to you know you have people who who will understand you who will also you know hear what you say and say oh god me too and i think that that's something that's really that that books provide when you can't necessarily even with the internet find those people um so books can be a way can be a bridge to finding those people a lot of the time. Yeah. And I, I, I uh, want to thank you for your comments around, you know, and, and language and culture of how to, how to be able to transmit those type of things. Um, we think of disrupted cultures, you know, throughout, I mean, here I, I, uh, with indigenous cultures uh, in the United States is that, that there's, there's this resiliency, vibrancy and creation and is going on that, 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 that that continues and comes on as a, as as a spirit um, as a spirit that goes forth. And um, I found that one thing that I know that has always been amazing is art and writing from everybody, from everybody, from everybody, because it feeds into my head and uh, it rounds out. It's like you were talking about the the object in the middle where you could see. The, sh- the shadows of different pieces of it and the language can approach it in, in different type of ways. It's uh, let me see it um, from all around as much as possible. Okay. Um, where do we find, uh, where do listeners find uh, your books? Um, I, I, I want to say, I saw that um, uh, the, the, the decorated one, the spine one is when the, I saw that book and I was like, Oh my gosh, that's so so beautiful. But where do, where do people, whatever version, uh, paperback, otherwise, uh, many half lived lives of Sam Sylvester so, uh, by Maya McGregor and uh, the books by Emmy Mears. Where do we go? So Sam should be um, available or orderable in Barnes and Noble if you're in the United States. Uh, Powell's definitely. Powell's. Um, um, any of your local indie book shops should have them. A books of Wonder in New York City, if you're on that side of the country, is a fantastic place to get their books. They've been they actually did another one of my launch events. They're he- been huge supporters of Sam Sylvester. If you're in the UK, Waterstones. Um, there also, I believe, are still some signed copies. If you happen to be in the UK um, through Waterstones here, uh, the Glasgow Waterstones has been taking care of that for me. Um, also, if you're in Glasgow, Canterbury is books. I have to shout them out. They are a local queer bookshop um, on the south side of Glasgow. Um, they're absolutely fantastic. Um, they, you can really find them just about anywhere books are sold for those ones. Um, for the Emmy Mayer's books, uh, 
they are also, I believe, orderable through um, through the bigger bookshops as well. Um, you should be able to still order them that way. If not, my publisher's website, which is BHC Press, um, has buy links to all of them. And diff- like every different real retailer under the uh, retailer under the sun, um, and uh, aye, and um, the uh, before we close off, I actually had a wee sneak peek of the next book for you. Oh yes, thank you, thank you, thank you. Very very wee sneak peek. So this is from um, the evolving truth of ever stronger will, and um, similar to Sam Sylvester, um, this it stars. Uh, an agender protagonist who um, has been dealing with a very abusive home life and the book opens with their mother dying of a heart attack in front of them. So it's no real spoiler since it happens in the first two seconds. But yeah, yeah. Um, the very first aspect of this book, um, this book came about the way a lot of my books do. Sam was a wee bit different, but Will started to me with the first page. And a lot of my books come out that way where I will have this flash of something that I sit down and I'll write the first few sentences or the first page and then I will walk away and it needs to like sit and steep for a while but Will's story is about trying to make it to their 18th birthday where they won't be put back into the system um, and to sort of navigate their mother's death and also process the leftover trauma um, whilst dealing with the fallout of their mother's life which is fun so um but it's written differently to sam so i actually wrote this in second person to a degree so it's slightly more closer to the literary uh term in apostrophe not the not the piece of punctuation but a style of writing in conversation with the reader almost um for a very particular reason so you'll hear this but it's very much about how queer kids we often are taught that we are monstrous in some way um, and the world shows us that we are not wanted and that we are not safe and um, particularly right now this is the sentiment that is is very resonant and I wrote this book in 2018 um, and I think it's only become more resonant but so you'll you'll hear that in the first page but this book is about well breaking down that societal projection and learning self-love and learning to accept themselves. Um, but here's where we start. Chapter one. You are a monster. You know this already. It's one of the first things you learned. One of the first lessons you felt down to the cells and atoms that make you up. Your electrons buzz with it. Since then, anyone who has tried to tell you otherwise, you have quietly counted among the world's many liars. You were born that way. That much you know. They called you Well, never mind what they called you. Your name is Will, and that's what matters now, that you found your name. People think it's supposed to be short for William, or even Wilhelmina, or in one annoying case, Willard. They're wrong about that, though, just like they're wrong about you not being a monster. Your name is Will because that's what it takes to live among people who hate you for no other reason than that you exist. So, Will. Will the monster. Here we are, and here you are. Your life is about to change. Ready? All right. Everybody buy their book. <laughs> I am McGregor. Um, that is up for pre-order. So. Up for pre-order. Hey, that pre-order is yeah. a big those thing, pre-orders. man. You, yeah. you come in you come in heavy with those pre-orders. Yes. People start smiling at you more, you know? Oh, yeah. And I think, <laughs> also, I, think, I think also we'll probably be doing some pre-order promotions closer to the day, but we've got... Um, yeah, it's, uh, it comes out Halloween, and this one also does have some ghosty elements to it. So I love – I don't know. This is just a random thought. I love fall books. I love, like – I mean, you have to get back. I get a little bit more of a school scout. I'm a union rep for you know, schools and stuff, but I get into that rhythm. I love the transition in my favorite season, summer, into fall, and I also love, like, September. And you get around, like, October, and I know my November books that come out, and – um it's, it, I, I, it's like a renewal. There's some tie to academics or something in my head too, where yeah, it's, it's like, oh, fresh, fresh stuff. Like, yeah, and traditionally in the Celtic traditions, uh, the new year started uh, way back. Celtic traditions, the new year began at um, Samhain, which is the which is Halloween, and that's actually oh. where where we celebrate that it comes from. 
the the old real you know Celtic and Gaelic traditions of of uh, Halloween. So wow, wow. Yeah. Um, so I I gotta I gotta tell you, um, uh, it's a particular thrill for me to have uh, recently uh, read. Um, the many half lived lives of Sam Sylvester to be able to talk to you about, um, and, and just, just learn and, and have these great, uh, conversations. I, I want to thank you for, for what you do. And it is not trite or anything. I want to thank you for what, for what you do, because it has a personal relevance, uh, for me and those around me it has particular relevance all the way over here in Oregon as a geographical, uh, location. And, um, it's nice to reach you for over from, uh, Scotland. I had, uh, one other guest from Scotland, uh, Francis McKee of the, the mm-hmm. Vaselines, but I think she, she's a singer for the Vaselines and, uh, she also is a yoga practitioner, oh, cool. but she was, she was, she was from the other city that you mentioned. And I'm not, I trying to, right I'm not doing any of that stuff because it's I don't like- know what I'm, <laughs> no, I like I like Edinburgh just fine. I do. I, I like I, I I I talk shit, but it's it's Edinburgh's fine. It's very pretty. Um, there's one other podcast uh, that's out of uh, Edinburgh. Um, um, Mum's uh, Mysteries and Murder, um, which is a a, a fun uh, true crime. I've, I've I've connected with with them as well. I uh, I do enjoy the ability to be able to talk to you in uh, this this worldwide podcast, talking about the arts. You know, what a time to be alive! Like we can actually just have a conversation, and I can see you, and like I mean, you listening yeah. can't see us, but we can see each other, and you know, it's 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 quite quite magical honestly that we've got to a place where we can have instantaneous communication with someone on the other side of the planet like occasionally i just think about life and things things are rough out there i'm not gonna lie but also we, we live in a time of magic as well so yeah and you know it's not ideal it's not perfect the online world is something but uh, as far as community building <laughs> you know like, <laughs> to know right this, yeah the, just this week's twitter Twitter fire. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll not say anything more than that. I'll just throw my rock across the room. Like yeah, just... that does it. That does it. The rock is um, <laughs> enough of it. The... Rock. <laughs> um, so yeah. much for having me. I really appreciate it. Absolutely. Um, I will uh, uh, steadfastly pre order uh, anybody <laughs> interested in things for authors and musicians or the pre-order tab for them. If you want to get it, even if you can get it, uh, you can afford to get it. That's how you get, get more of the things you like. We get pre-order more of it. <laughs> to, to make the things happen that, <laughs> that you want them. That's how you get more of what you like. You pre-order things you like. <laughs> Great. Thank you so much, uh, Maya McGregor. Uh, thank you. Um, thank you for your stories. And, uh, Gosh, I know um, we probably had another three hours in us if we wanted to, but we'll leave we'll we'll leave that in the, for for the for the for the future. But I'm um, just really wishing you a, a, a beautiful day, and thank you for your time on something rather than nothing. Thanks very much for having me. It's been a pleasure. Absolutely. This is something rather than nothing. 